And we have sacrificed for this place to be here. We have prayed. We've walked in love. And if you, I'm just telling you, you can come in on a Tuesday afternoon or a Friday morning and God's here all by, all by yourself and you feel the presence of God. But honestly, this house is not the sanctuary of God in the New Testament. Hold your hands out and look at you. Say, this is the temple of God. Now, for your walk in prayer and prayer like you breathe, you have to become aware of that, that he is within you, not theoretically, philosophically, or whatever. He's in you, okay? Now, how many temples of the Holy Spirit are here tonight? You have to be born again to qualify. We're okay. Now, what, if we can go back to the scripture in Matthew 21, 13, what did Jesus say that the house of God would be called? He said, my temple, my house will be called a house of prayer. Now, are we following here? You say, don't make me religious. I'm not going to make you religious. Let me ask you this. When Peter and John were walking with Jesus and fishing with Jesus and in ministry, they weren't religious. They were walking with God. It's a big difference, okay? So, what should you be called? Say, my house is a house of prayer. My house is a house of prayer. Hallelujah. Now, skip down the same chapter, verse 21. And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done in the fig tree, but even if you say the mountain be taken up and cast into the sea, it'll happen. And all things you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. How many of our prayers should we expect to be answered? All of them. He is a prayer answering God. Now you say, well, I know some people that get more prayers answered than others. You know, that's a given. But what I want you to think about tonight is that the people who routinely get answers to prayer are those who have decided to honor the Lord with their presence and let him honor them with his presence. When a life, any life, anywhere that loves God throws out the welcome mat to the Holy Spirit, you just roll out the red carpet and say, oh, let me ask you this. As soon as I say that, you think, what? Give up all the movies I couldn't watch G with Jesus? Oh, okay. We, uh, how many understand we watched some movies you couldn't watch? If Jesus rang the doorbell, you turned the TV off. <laughs> now I'm going to just throw a really amazing thing out to you. If you will decide, if I can't watch it in the presence of the Lord, I'll not watch it at all. And you say, nobody did that. Peter and John did. Yeah. Peter and John walked away. Peter and Andrew, James and John walked away from absolutely everything to walk with God. They walked with the living God incarnate. They walked with Jesus. And you know what? They lived without HBO. They lived. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Yeah. And you say, why is it worth it? Because what they got in return was such an anointing on their lives that when they were brought before the council in the book of Acts, these religious leaders wanted to scorn them for their lack of education and that the, the Bible says they recognized them as having been with Jesus. Yeah. They, had, there had come such a likeness of the Holy Spirit of the living God, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ on your life, that people will recognize you as having the touch of the divine on your life. Yeah. And I'm not talking about being poopy. I'm talking about being real. And you say, well, what does it cost? Well, it costs walking in love. The biggest thing that's ever cost me was my sarcastic tongue. And you might say, oh, Pastor, you never had a sarcastic tongue. I could use my tongue to cut you to pieces faster, more nimbly than anyone you've ever seen. I'm not proud of it. And you say, well, what changed it? I both, oh, first of all, the chapter of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, where it says, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, God made you memorize this. And then any time that I knew I'd be like in a social function where, you know, you can show off, put people down. Don't tell me you can't. Any time I'd be tempted to slip back and put in a real zinger, on the way there, you'd have to go over that. At least right now, that's the farthest thing from my mind. And you say, why? Now listen. There comes a point in your life when walking in love is so fruitful and so productive and so peaceful that you just don't want to say stupid things to people to hurt them. Yeah. But this is what, um, okay, hold that thought. Here we go. The disciples learn from the Lord Jesus a lifestyle of prayer and fellowship. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here about Jesus' life. Luke 6, 12 and 13. This is the night before he appointed the disciples. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. 
And when the day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. So here we ask the question, what do you do before an important life-altering decision? You see, he, he changed history with his decision. He had to choose 12 of the people who were with him, and he needed to get the right quote. And he had to hear from God. When you have to hear from God, you just put the decision on hold until you know you've heard from God. He prayed. Yeah. Now, I know I'm saying, well, this is not exciting. No, but the, the results, let me explain something. You know when he preached that the other night about the character of God there at the end of the sermon? Nobody on earth could have preached that with that anointing unless that person has walked with God. You can't get that off the internet. You can download a hundred sermons. And you can preach them. And you can preach the same thing he preached, but you only get that anointing from walking with God. And you say, well, how do you walk with God? You let him into your consciousness and into your presence every moment of every day. You say, why would I want to do that? Well, let me ask you this. Why would Peter and Andrew, James, and John leave a thriving, well-to-do fishing business to walk with the living God? Why would they? Because he was worth it. Yeah. You see what? Yeah. We'd be way more impressed if he was here in the flesh. God would be impressed by our faith if we took him at his word, okay? Look at Luke 9, 28, what happens here. Some eight days after these things, he took along Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. Did I just give you that one verse? This is the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, if you read about it, Moses and Elijah appeared to him. Jesus was glorified. His face glowed like a sun. Let me ask you something. How many of you would like to have that prayer today? You saw Moses, you saw Elijah, they come back from heaven. You heard them discussing the things of the cross. It says that they discussed the departure which he was going to accomplish. Moses and Elijah came to visit the king of glory to encourage him while he was here in the flesh to go through with the cross. And Peter, James, and John got to witness the whole thing. Now, if they were having that prayer meeting, I'd like to be there. Amen. Do you see what I'm saying? When you attend a prayer meeting, who do you expect to pray with? Jesus. The, no, listen. The Holy Spirit who takes hold with us together against the way Ron preached the other day is the Spirit of the living God. When you pray, Jesus is there. And he's not a second-rate Jesus. He said, well, if I could just see him in the flesh. He didn't like that kind of carnality. He likes, he likes faith. And every time we pray, he shows up. Prayer opens the door to the supernatural. And without prayer, we live very natural, frustrated lives. I don't know how to explain this real well. But I can tell you that I learned to pastor a church when I worked at Mass Mutual in the 70s. I worked at Mass Mutual Life Insurance. Computers were just in the birthing process. I learned COBOL. And I was responsible. I've told some of you this, but maybe you something I've come before. I was responsible for paper tape. Do you know how our paper tape systems were? They were these long rolls of paper with hole punches in it. They should have been updated 15 years, 10 to 15 years before because we had made progress by that time. But here's the deal. The only person in the whole company, 2,500 people in this, that worked right here at Springfield, Mass., one person could read paper tapes. And if the system busted, they had to have a production that day. And I was the liaison between our part department and the vice president, who's now a vice president. And every time the paper tape broke down, I had to go and sweet talk him and to read it. Just one more time, we're going to get fixed, but if you can bail us out, we sure would appreciate it. And they said, we think you could deal well with this, so just be nice to him and he'll give you what you need. And he was, well, listen, this is what God told me. He said, if you'll stay in my presence, be aware of my presence and honor me here, and do your work right, and in the leftover time, because I could give everything they'd done, I, he said, you study the word. Now, I got everything they'd done, and they were giving me more projects. I'm not saying you study the word of company time until they give you, you don't have anything else to do. He said, if you'll do that, I'll bring that system under budget every time, because they warned me. You get a lot of spots from the uh, uh, authorities that be, you can't bring a system in under budget. But he said, you won't be able to, because we never have, but just, we'll, we'll take care of it. In the... I only worked there a couple years, but in the two years I worked there, the paper tape system never broke down. Except one time I went to, for a final vacation, 
up in Maine with my parents' cottage, and the thing blew up the whole weekend. <laughs> and I've been trying to witness, boy, New England back then, there weren't very many born again Christians then. I've been trying to quietly witness to these people. And this girl said, don't you ever go on vacation again. And I said, okay. And she said, how do you keep this thing running? And I said, do you really want to know? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what I was going to say. But here's my point. I learned how to pastor a church because at that job, I learned that if I would respect God and be aware of his presence, you see, how do you do that? You cultivate an awareness of his presence where you're just grateful for him. There it comes, and you say, does it cost you? Yeah, it costs a lot. It costs me my caustic, sarcastic tongue. It costs me the ability to say what I always wanted to say sometimes. It costs me walking in love. I, I mean, I, would, I treated everybody good. We had secretaries, and I just treated everybody good. And, and you know what happens? Come God comes. And I'm just telling you, yeah. I want to talk to you about praying like you breathe. To where you say, oh God, I'm alive unto you and you're alive unto me. And I want you to walk in me the way you walked in Jesus. Right. Right. Prayer opens doors to the supernatural. Now some would say that Jesus was extreme in his teaching on prayer. Look at Luke 18.1. In Luke 18.1, he was telling them a parable to show that they ought to pray and not lose heart when at all times. Now, here's what we do. We read it, uh -huh. and we, we think, well, he was speaking evangelistically, metaphorically at all times. You know? You know, Jesus prayed at all times. He's always aware of God's presence. Let me ask you this. Can you breathe all the time? <laughs> Did you know that you can learn to pray the way you breathe? Yeah. And you say, well, how would I do that, Pastor? Well, first of all, the part that is alive unto God is your spirit. And this world tends to feed our flesh. We all know uh -huh. from food to advertisements nobody should see. All right, this is promoting the flesh. It even mm -hmm. promotes the mind. You know, we're an educated society. We, we, we pour $100,000 into a kid's mental education. And yet when it comes to our spiritual education, if, we, if you're here on a Wednesday night getting the Word of God, some people think you're flat out nuts. That's true. But your spirit is not the least important part of you. It's the most important part. Yeah. So what you want to do, if you, if you really want to get to where you're aware of God and carry the anointing of God wherever you go, is you do things that stir up your spirit and feed your spirit. The biggest bridges you have between here and heaven are the Word of God. This is Jesus. He became flesh. The Word of God and prayer. And if you're filled with the Spirit, praying in tongues is the fastest way I can get in the Spirit. I love to pray in the Spirit because it's a gift. Now, perhaps part of the problem with this understanding on prayer is that um, we think prayer is please do this and please do that. Now, I know, and the truth is, when John comes up in a few minutes, we'll hand him all his request, and that will be the part. For right now, that is the right part of prayer. But if you look at the disciples, they didn't go around walking after Jesus saying, please do this, please do no, One time they asked, they asked him to kill Peter's mother-in-law, but most of the time, they just hung out with him. Please go to Luke 12, 39-44. God wants us to be able to ask our questions. And he wants us to be able to expect answers. Luke 12, 39 44. This is just the end of a parable here, but I want to show you something when Peter starts talking. Jesus said, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You to be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And then Jesus goes on to answer. Now my point here is, Peter had a question. Here's my question. Was he praying? Yes. Yeah, he's talking to Jesus. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. We want Jesus to be here so that we can have a great life. The greatest friend we'd ever had. Yeah. But he was praying. But one day, one day, it was noon. And I had been doing all these things, and 
And I said to the Lord, oh, I heard I there was a TV preacher. I said, God, I pray. Oh, Lord, I need to pray. He says, what have we been doing? Come on. And I said, I wasn't praying. I was talking to you. He said, was I talking to you? Yeah. Were you at, he said, was I answering your questions? Yeah. When did you start talking to me for? I got out of bed. He says, let's pray. I yeah. said, I wasn't very religious. He says, I can't stand it. <laughs> he doesn't want to, uh, listen, Amen. the reason you don't like prayer is because you don't understand. Peter says, he looks at this parable, he couldn't figure it out, he says, Lord, are you talking to us, to them? And he said, oh, that's not prayer. Yes, it is. Sure. You got questions? And you think, 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 I wonder what, I have found God is more than willing to answer my questions. I don't always get immediate answers. But if I have something, I said, Lord, I just don't understand the problem in this area. I don't know why I can't get along with this person or whatever that is. You go to God with your questions, and you're an open and sincere believer. He will answer your questions. You say, you have scripture on it? Yeah, we're going to see that, that Jesus said, Our Father and I have come, and we'll make ourselves known to him. Now, look at Luke 18. And then I, I do want to get to one of the passages before we put here. Luke, Luke 18, 24. This is where the rich young ruler has just turned Jesus down flat. <coughs> and again, Peter has a question. Verse 24, Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they who heard it said, Well, who can be saved? And he, he said, The things are possible with people are possible with God. And Peter said, look, we left our homes, everything, and we followed you. Now, why did Peter say that? What he's saying is, is, is this going to be fair? Is this going to turn out right? We, we, he wouldn't do it, but we did it. What's in it for us? You see, I wouldn't dare talk to Jesus like that, Peter did. Yeah. And he did not get a slap across the mouth. I mean, I've been in the ministry at times when we were starting out. I said, are we fools? I feel like a fool for being here. We're not getting up. But listen, yeah. look at what Jesus, Jesus went right on and talked to him there. If you want to read it. We stopped at verse, what, 30? Or verse 29. He said, truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom who will not receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Did Jesus ever rebuke him for asking that? No. If you feel like you've really done beyond the call of duty and aren't seen it, then you need to go to God and be honest. Be respectful. Don't ever be disrespectful, but be honest. Amen. Prayer is talking to God. It's hanging out with him every moment of your life and knowing him well enough to ask to answer questions. Prayer is also receiving instructions for the day and clarification. We're right here in Luke 18. Look at Luke 22, 8. Luke 22, 8, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go prepare Passover for us so that we may eat it. Are they, are they praying? Yeah. I really got to get your mind around this. Are they praying? Yeah, they're talking to Jesus. That's yes. prayer. Prayer is talking to the Lord. Okay? Now, in the next verse, verse 9, they said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? Can you ask for clarification? Yes. Yeah, if the Lord really impresses you to do something, the next thing you say, well, I don't know how I'm going to do that when I'd already promised. How do I do that? We need to be so good with God we can ask him and expect an answer because yeah. he, he gives clarification. Now look at verse 10. And he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house he enters, and you'll say to the owner of the house, and if you read the whole story, it happened, remember the story, it happened exactly the way they said, do God's instructions pan out? And if you say, this is so far beyond me, Pastor, I can't even imagine. Okay, can I give you starters where, where to start? Yeah. When you wake up, before you do anything else, you acknowledge and respect. You would not be in the presence of a commanding officer if you're in the military without acknowledging that commander's presence. You would never not acknowledge the presence. No. There was a general in the room you would acknowledge. And more than that, now listen, if he was there, you would always be aware of him because you knew that he was the one you were out to face. 
That's why he put it. You understand? And he said, oh, this is a huge burden. Yeah, it is if you don't like Jesus. <laughs> no, no, wait, wait. I understand. I told God, they're not going to like this. Are you sure you have me Oh, listen. If you had been fishing the day Jesus looked at them and said, follow me, would you have considered it a huge burden to walk away from the stinking fish and walk with Jesus? It's an honor. It's a joy. If, if he said, come on, let's go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Let's hang with Moses and Elijah. Would that have been a four? I don't think so. All right. So what is prayer? Prayer is fellowship where you can ask your friend questions. Prayer is receiving instructions and getting clarification of needed. Prayer is walking with God to where you realize what you're forgetting. He gives you divine revelation. Now, I know we've experienced that where you know, where you know you need to call somebody and you don't even know they're hurting, but you find out that they were. Where his light is flooding your daily walk. And like I said, if you tell me, Pastor, I just flat out don't like prayer, then I would just say that either you don't understand prayer or you don't like Jesus. Because to, if you'll look in here, when, when Jesus left, they were praying. You say, what do you mean? They were talking to Jesus when he ascended to heaven. That's prayer. First thing they did is they went into Jerusalem to pray. Why? Because they missed him. They prayed until the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. And after that, they really, really prayed. And you say, why would I want to... Okay. How many if you... Uh, let me ask you this. Have you ever learned anything new about God that you didn't know before? Yes. Okay. How many of you know there's still things... To learn. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how many of you, how many of you were raised in church where you never, ever heard of healing? You had no clue you could ask God for healing. I had no clue, okay? Well, you could learn about that, and aren't you glad you did? Yeah. Now, I know that tonight's is a little far out there. I probably wouldn't tire teaching on a Sunday morning, and then I, because I'm yeah. something, you know? But you know, I wouldn't, I want you to understand that that message he preached about the character of God the other night. He could not have preached that unless he walked with God. Yeah. That doesn't mean he's perfect. I don't know he's not perfect. And I'm not perfect. And you don't have to be perfect. But you can walk with God. Yeah. And if that's available, wouldn't you want somebody to tell you that was available? Yeah. Now look at John 14. See, he wants us to use us to heal the sick. And, and before we can do that, we've got to be aware that that is very much with us. Now, this is what Jesus said, John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, let's say right here, right now. If I don't, more people just walk with God. Because when you walk with God, you have to be obedient. Mm. You don't want to obey. He'll love you, but he'll back off. Yeah. Actually, you're going to push him away. You don't obey. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him. Now, you can go home tonight and say, <clears throat> boy, but you preach it. Boy, I'll do it. But this is what Jesus said. Yeah. The Holy Spirit of truth, whom the world has no clue about, because it doesn't see him or know him. Do you know him? Mm. Yeah. Does it say you know him? Yeah. yeah. Now, all of us have heard from him one time or another. We wouldn't even be sitting here tonight. Yeah. The day that you got saved, you felt his presence, and you knew better than you knew your name, that you were a lost sinner headed for damnation. You didn't know somebody. That was the spirit of a living God, loving with convicting you. We've all known him. But nobody will know him better than they want to know him because he's a gentleman. Look at what it says. It says you, it, the world doesn't know or, or see him, but you know him. Why? Because he abides with you and he'll be in you. You say, well, I'm not aware of him. Well, I just want you to know you can be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Hallelujah. Jesus said that our prayers would not be addressed to a far-off deity. Now, we don't pray to the Holy Spirit, but you have to understand I've heard people say, well, I just couldn't get my prayers above the ceiling. Why would he have to go above the ceiling? Yeah. Amen. Okay. Hallelujah. Now look at verse 17. That's what we just read. Verse 18. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a while, the world won't see me. But you'll see me. Mm. Now, I must be with the eyes of your spirit. I have never seen it with the eyes of my flesh. But 
but I've seen his hands and I know, okay? Yeah. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, my Father, and you in me, and I in you. You know what that means? We are one big happy family and one little compact, compact package. And I put in my notes, some of us are more compact than others. <laughs> but you've got God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, and they're living in you. And you say, it's not real to me. Well, if you want it to be real, it can become real. I'm here to tell you that. It, hallelujah. Amen. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Oh, my goodness. What is the price for walking with God? Admitting that he's God. And that if, if you wouldn't ask Jesus Christ to come in the flesh and sit down and watch a movie with you, you don't watch it. If you wouldn't cuss somebody out when he was standing there, you don't cuss them out now. You don't cuss them out without the cuss words. I've had people cuss me out. They just didn't use the cuss words. Same spirit. Sure. You become to where, as you would live in heaven, you live here because you know he's here. And when that happens, he will use you and he will show himself to you. Amen. Think of this. Is the word of God from Genesis to Revelation a progressive revelation? And with that, we learned it in Bible college, but we know. Yes, all Bible, there's very few things that almost all Bible scholars agree on, okay? But if you go back to Genesis, he doesn't show everything about himself. But in every book, he reveals more. In Exodus, he reveals more than Genesis. Amen? We, how many of you know that just from growing up in church? This is a progressive revelation. Yeah. Now, how many of you can agree that from the time you got saved until now, you have experienced progressive revelation? Yeah. Okay. Now here's our problem. We just drew a line and said that's all the better anybody can know God because that's all the better I know God. Uh -oh. Well, when I see people that know God better, it makes me jealous. It's supposed to. Yeah. He's a jealous God. He wants all of you. And that doesn't mean that I don't want I want them to know him less, but I think, wait a minute. Yeah. If Kenneth E. Hagan can walk with God, I can walk with uh, God. Yeah. And I don't know him as well today as I want to know him, but I know him a whole lot better than I did 10 years ago. So be open to the fact that this is progressive revelation. Praying at all times means to open your conscious awareness to his companionship, his correction, his guidance, to defer to him, to honor him, to honor his presence in your life. Just tell him you have permission to speak up any moment today where I'm doing something that grieves you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay. The more powerful your revelation of your father's love, the more automatic prayers are. The people that get prayers answered just like this are the ones who walk with God to where they're friends. He can ask anything of you, this person, but they can ask anything of him. That's the goal. Look at verse, are we still in John 22? Let's read two more verses here. Then I want to talk about Acts 10 real fast. John 22, excuse me, yeah, 1422. Judas not as scary, said to the Lord, when then has happened then, then what then has happened that you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world it's just just i know this we've asked this five times but that, does jesus make it real real clear uh -huh. the world's not even going to recognize his presence in your life but you're going to know him yeah. makes it real clear about 20 times or you know at least 10 times in the passage <coughs> that's right and jesus answered and said to him if anyone loves me he will keep my word what's the condition of walking in his presence Love him and obey him. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. So, at any rate, we make God our home. We roll out the red carpet of hospitality by showing respect, and we listen for him to whisper. And I, want, I just want to talk to you. I won't have time to read it, I don't think. The real reason I wanted to talk to you about prayer is that right now, there is a wall of unbelief between us and the healing ministry that we long for. Now, it isn't that we're not seeing healings. You, Sherry, you have been healed of a death sentence. Okay? Bill is here supernaturally. We are not where we were in our understanding of healing. You understand that? Because yeah. we've had, we just haven't done funerals. We've seen one after another. We could have lost Sherry again this last time. Sherry Holland, she's doing fine. She's going to do fine. Thank uh, God. Yeah. One after another. So we are grateful for every bit. But we also know Jesus said you'll go out and lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Yeah. So what, let me tell you a story in Acts chapter 10. We'll have to read a couple of verses. I've got eight minutes. Okay, here we go. You know the story of Cornelius, the first 
You have to understand that the first 10 years after Jesus ascended to the Father, there were no Gentiles getting saved, only Jewish people. How many Jewish people do we have here? Okay? That would have left every one of us out. Okay? 10 years! Can you imagine going to the cross and for 10 years not one Gentile gets saved? Now why is that? Because there's a wall of misunderstanding yeah. where the Jews are absolutely positive that nobody but Jews is saved, so they preach to Jews. One man, Cornelius, a Roman centurion, was aware of the fact that he was lost and he began praying. Okay? He began praying. How? Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the, the Italian cohort. Next verse, please. A devout man, one who feared God with all his household, and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. He said, wasn't he saved? No, he, he didn't know anything about how to get saved. Okay? And about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. So here's a man who's on the wrong side of the wall saying, God, I know you're out there. And he just kept praying and praying and giving and giving and praying until it became a memorial and God had to do something. Huh. On the other side of the wall, we have the Apostle Peter. Now this, listen to me. In this story, you're not Cornelius, you're Peter. Because the, pe the group of people I'm trying to get to have a prayer life and pray this vision through are here tonight. And you're not here tonight because you're desperate for healing or desperate for money. There were times you were. Everyone, I go around. I know when you were desperate for money. But you're not desperate. No. Peter wasn't desperate for nothing except that he loved God. Now watch, watch what happens in um, Acts 10 verse 9. The, the angel tells Cornelius to send people to Peter, but Peter wasn't going to go anyhow. You know what saved him? Prayer. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Next verse. It, it says he got real hungry. He became hungry and was desiring to eat, but while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. Now listen carefully. While he has this vision, he fell into a trance and has a vision. You remember the sheep comes down three times with unclean things, and the Lord's voice says, Arise, kill it, or Peter, kill and eat. He said, I've never done it. He said, What I call clean, no longer call unclean. Now listen. Yeah. What if, while he was hungry, he said, I'm just going to shake the grease with the maids while they make the lunch. Now listen. This is a real important point. It's not wrong to have fellowship. It's not wrong to enjoy the people. But there's times when you have an urgency to pray. If Peter had not obeyed God to go and pray, it says while he was praying, God spoke to him. I will show you later in the chapter when he's up there at Cornelius' house, he said, when I was praying, the Lord spoke to me to come. He said, why is that important? Two men on two sides of that wall. Cornelius saying desperately, I need you to tell me how to find out to get saved. You're right? And, and he sent an angel and said, go send for Peter. Peter I don't know if I can explain this, so I don't get this very good. Peter had two choices. Can I tell you what most Christians do? They get just as spiritual as they have to be to keep themselves and family to heaven and enjoy life. Yeah. Isn't that the point? But Peter had a heart for Jesus and for the purposes of God. And even when he didn't have to pray, he didn't say his wife was sick, didn't say he was sick, didn't say anybody in the house was sick or that they lacked anything. He had an urgency to pray and he went and prayed. And let's, let's just look really fast. Verse, um, we only got a couple minutes here. 13 to 15. A voice came to him and said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And then in verse 19, it says that while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, The three men are here. Here's my point. <coughs> we as a church, we have a marvelous time when we're together. We have, we can party, you know? And it's good. It's good. We don't fight. We just have a good time. And that's awesome. Yeah. But no matter how long we are a church, we have to always remember that our first purpose, if we're going to pray down the wall, there's a wall right now. Mm -hmm. It's in my understanding. Yeah. And it's a lack of understanding in me. I, I pray for people. And seeing him heal, boom! I prayed for Mateo once. It looked like he was going to lose his livelihood because he couldn't move his arm. And I knew it was by the Spirit of God. He just went. Another lady came up, and she, right before service, gave me every single symptom of cervical cancer. I said, lady, you're going to the doctor in the morning unless you're healed tonight. 
And I was scared. I was really scared. This is a faithful member of our church about eight years ago. And when she came up, she was walking up and on the way up, oh, she's here. I knew that I, that's called the gift of faith. Most of the time, you don't operate in gift of faith. You use your faith. Are you following me? Yeah. That night, God put into me the gift of faith. I knew that I knew that I knew before I ever laid hands on her. And in that, that, at, at that moment, the symptoms stopped. She didn't go to the doctor. She has, she's 10 years down the road and healed. Now listen. What am I telling you? <laughs> there's, there's something that we're not getting here. Because yeah. when Jesus said, lay hands on the second number of heaven, it's yeah. there for us. Yeah. But just the way Cornelius said, I'm not quitting crying out until I find the living God. And God showed up with the angel. And Peter said, anything you want me to do today? And says, yeah, go preach to the Gentiles. He says, you've got to be kidding me. And God got me. Okay? Yeah. We have, the good part about it is, I'm almost done. When you commit yourself to the purposes of God, like, I'll be honest with you, I spend eight or nine times as much time praying for y'all as I do me. And then y'all, most of you don't be prayer all the time. But I really do, and I'm not saying that to crack. I'm saying it because I found out that if I do that, my, my own needs are no-brainers. To walk with God is just the best way in the whole world to live. When I said, like, I got the email about Christiana's trip, and my first thing was, oh, is this you? No. I, my first thought was, you know, I've come a long way. Because 10 years ago, I thought, well, do I want her to go? Will I have the money for it? No, there was only one question. Did this idea come from God? Yeah. And when you live that way, you are on, it's like a Holy Ghost torpedo behind you, or a, a rocket. Yeah. Because nobody can stop what God has ordained. Amen. But to get there, you have to pay the price. Amen. Just like they did, a walk away from everything else and say, let me hang with you, Lord. Amen? I don't know if I've helped you, but I sure Amen. 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 Am